So, Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode here on Tales from the Wandering Scribe. I am your host, Guillermo Garcia, otherwise known as the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe. And we have another, making this our third double author interview here on the channel. Now, my guests today are the creative duo behind the urban fantasy series Moonlight in Glenwood. And the series has grown rapidly since the launch of their first book, Moonburn, in 2022. Three books and two novellas in, their world is showing no signs of slowing down. The pair have worked on creative pursuits together for over a decade, including game design and visual art. Their novels are their latest passions. And to tell us more about their series and more, let's give a huge round of applause to the creative team, the duo themselves, the dynamic duo, Ainsley J. Frazier and Lita Hunt. Ainsley, Lita, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hi, thanks for having us. No problem. So before we dive into um, Moonlight in Glenwood as well as Moonburn, is there anything else you would guys like to add about uh, your backgrounds? You've got the more impressive one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we've been doing many creative endeavors for a while. We have a couple, I have a couple credits for like doing game design for Paizo and things of that nature. Um, Lita's run other various groups. We're big into like the world of gaming, including um, urban fantasy and reading of that nature as well. So we have a lot of ring to the table before we started writing our book series for the first time. Um, nice. Oh, and we are not a couple. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I was like, you have to like, I was like has people, have people, I like a little tent, has people assume that about you guys? Yes. We, there's a, there's a little hierarchy and this happens. So you meet us and you go through a couple months of, are they the same person? Like, are, are they just like one person? Hmm. And then something happens that they go, okay, no, there's definitely two people. Like, well, okay, so they're, they're a couple. Okay, they're just a couple. And then they get to know us better. And suddenly I mentioned my husband and they think that's her. Um, and I'm like, oh, and then we have to crush their dreams. They're like, but you have my favorite couple. And I'm like, but we've never been a couple. Oh, oh my gosh. That is so funny. Oh my God. Oh my, oh, I needed that laugh. That that was that was perfect. So tell us about your urban fantasy series. Cause I see from the get-go, definitely I'm getting werewolf vibes. So what can you tell us about that? Do you want to do the thing? Um, I can do the thing. So okay. Moonlight and Glenwood is an open supernatural world, uh, wherein supernaturals came out in the post-war era of 1950s and integrated into society. So our series is current, set in current day, well, 2019, current-ish day these days, <laughs> current right. day, of uh, dealing with how does that shake out when you have neighbors who turn into wolves, uh, witches down the street, vampires. Mm -hmm. So our series follows Evie and Laika, but are two moonlighters. That means they're part-time SWAT for supernatural crimes. When your neighbors are werewolves and get into domestic dispute, do you send a human? Or do you send a werewolf to deal with that problem? Oh, that is a that you know that almost reminds me of the movie uh, Bright, where it's like orcs and fairies and humans coexist, and it's just you know no brand. But that is really really fascinating. Like the idea of like you know supernatural integrating itself with the modern world, and I I can imagine if a world like that existed, spirits would definitely be a lot more creative and inventive definitely want to be boring because you never know okay do i'm gonna go in the house that has a witch who's going to probably throw a potion at me it's either going to a kill me or turn me into an animal or do i want to deal with the person that is literally an eight foot tall wolf that can cut off my head with a single <laughs> slap of his paw <laughs> yes. oh my goodness that that sounds Incredible. So let's actually talk about the lead up to this. So you guys have worked on different uh, projects uh, separately. So coming together, 
how did the conception of this urban fantasy series uh, come about? And did it go through a series of trials? Were like, you know, werewolves initially the thing you want to explore? Or was it like other supernatural elements? So um, back in 2019? Yep. Yeah, back in 2019, Netflix put out a thing called Love, Death, and Robots. Mm -hmm. And there's the military werewolf one. Yes. It had the coolest werewolf transformations. Now, me and my friends all love Supernaturals. We had played uh, werewolf and vampire and Dungeons and Dragons and all that before. So I'm watching it with two of my friends and they're like, yeah, those are awesome. I was like, yeah, you had to watch this. This was a really good one. Um, <laughs> and then we go, why don't we just play a game of werewolf? Like, that could be fun. Let's just play some werewolf. And I was like, yeah, I'll run it. I was like, but let's like do open world. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's just do this fun little one shot. <laughs> of where um, and then we realized by like the second session, we weren't even using character sheets anymore. So we were just kind of like playing a game. And my friends are super into high fantasy. So elves and dwarves into our open world made sense. And then we played. And then the pandemic, or sorry, the global situation happened. This goes on YouTube. So yeah, the global, global situation. situation. And uh, um, we you, you can that. say you can say uh, pandemic. A lot of people have said this. You guys are fine. Yeah. The uh, well, 2020 happened, and we both lost our jobs. And I'll let you pick up from there. Uh, so, well, you were on maternity leave, on maternity leave and I, fired. And fired. Uh, my company had announced its closing at the start of 2020, and then the shutdown happened. So. We're sitting in the middle of summer trying to mass apply for jobs, find new jobs. And there's only so many you can, so many job apps you can do a day or it just gets disheartened. Right. So mm -hmm. we decided to do something creative to kind of just good for your brain. Mm -hmm. And then we finished well, it. And then we kept going. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what? You got, we're all in the same boat. Literally that period Mm -hmm. in time was literally the second awakening for authors and creators to literally just create world as also a way to like escape the bleak reality that it was because I was literally in graduate school and I had to leave graduate school to go remote for the last maybe almost like a year and a half before the final semester I can actually go back up and it, it was like nice but it's like wow literally I was stuck in like room well not a room like my parents house but like just mm -hmm. writing just to not go completely insane but mm -hmm. i would imagine that crafting this werewolf sorry well urban fantasy series that has werewolves dwarves elves you want to make it you know unique and definitely fresh because i'm sure you guys have probably seen for some reason i don't know what it is Werewolf and romance seems to be the most common thing when it comes to fantasy. So I'm actually really, really happy that, you know, there's a werewolf story that's not really that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, viewers and listeners. If you like writing that, you know, kudos to you. But just saying, it's nice that there's a little bit of variety in the werewolf uh, type as well as urban fantasy uh, story. So when you guys were penning this together... What was your initial goal setting out with this, as well as the need you want to satisfy for fans who enjoy sort of urban fantasy stories? Do you want to go? Well, I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head. Like, I love werewolves, but I'm not really into the, I'm not much of a romance reader. So the alpha romance books don't really scratch that itch for me. There's not a whole right. ton of just, action werewolf books. yes okay. and there's not a lot of female action werewolf books out there as yes well, because there's nothing pretty about female werewolves per se yeah, so. i think the exception Correct. is women of the other world yeah women of the other world those are great werewolves i love them <laughs> <laughs> so we did not set out to reinvent the urban fantasy genre we set mm -hmm. out to tell stories that fit into the genre actually pretty well just with our own spin on it we pulled our elves and we pulled our dwarves we have vampires and we have witches we've you know picked los angeles and moved it forward holding to history but what would have happened if these also existed mm -hmm. um and we just want to tell badass stories about 
badass werewolves mm-hmm. doing cool things. And my love of police procedurals definitely <laughs> helps set that theme. So. <laughs> awesome. So imagine, you know, penning the story, going through edits, revisions, mm-hmm. trying to make sure it's the story that you guys want to tell. Will you guys reach that point where we got it, hit the story, got the covers, we've had it edited, we've had it reviewed, and now publishing it, what were the initial reactions like from friends and family? Were they positive, mixed? And is there one review that stands out to you guys? Our reviews have actually been really positive. Uh, As I said, we're not looking to reinvent uh, a wheel. We're looking to tell really cool stories within the wheel. And therefore, if you like urban fantasy, you tend to like this story. It's just what it is. And we set out to tell stories for women in their 30s. And then we discovered that we were incorrect about who our audience was because of the feedback we got. Um, We've had, I think the oldest we've seen is like 65, 70 year old men on table to buy the next book. They like it. They enjoy it, right? They're here. They want cool stories that are always just about romance. Don't get me wrong. We have a romance running, but it is a BC plot, not the focus of the story. <laughs> um, we we discovered much younger also enjoy the stories that we're telling because they don't have a high spice level. They're steamy. Mm. I think the thing that we would probably be most wary on with younger readers is we do have, you're very good at writing horror. <laughs> <laughs> so we may have some horror moments mm-hmm. that maybe I wouldn't want a 13 year old to read. But, but we had the 13 year old at con who came up to get that book. Yep. Her dad questioned, can you even read that? And she came back the next time to get book two and it was great. So it was like a oh, feeling. Apparently she could. <laughs> um, so oh yeah. my goodness. We've had a very good reception. Um, if you like urban fantasy, you'll like this. And our families have been very supportive. Um, I don't know if they necessarily know what we're doing. Wing, but you know <laughs> they're very supportive of the fact that we're doing it. Yeah, our mo- our mothers both <laughs> always make sure to bring oh, books. Man. Them. <laughs> exactly. I think a couple of my cousins read it, but that's as far as family goes. Um, let me see. There's we've had. I suppose as far as like formally getting reviews, we haven't gotten a ton on like the Amazon platform, but we're not very good at like farming that stuff. You'll discover marketing is our failure. Uh, <laughs> is very much our failure we're still working on learning how to do a lot of that stuff um but of the reviews we got it's all been positive people like the stories you're telling they like the people that we're creating in our past world and i think for me my favorite feedback we ever got was from janelle ah uh, yes <laughs> so our editor obviously she she's a working become full-time editor right now she's great but she at her normal day job she was telling her co-worker about what she was editing and a co-worker went, I want to read it. And you're like, yeah, go for it. Like, it's fine. We need beta readers. This is well in that category. Go for it. So Janelle started reading it and then came back with this. And it was endearingly threatening. That was like, endearingly hey, threatening? Like, I'm halfway through. It better not be Alfred. And I was like, oh, you, care. you care so much that you felt a need to send it right through our editor to us. Okay. Yeah. Well, great feedback. That means you're invested. It means you're feeling things. Oh my gosh. So, okay. That actually pretty perfectly to the next question. So from that reaction, from that response, did that kind of, in a way, validate your guys' goal setting out with this series that literally someone passionately threatened you guys that I'm enjoying this book so much, but I swear if you do anything that makes me want to throw this book away, I will never forgive you guys. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it definitely is fueling book four right now. I want these reactions to what we're doing. It's going to be so good. They're going to hate us so much. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I love this. Okay, this I'm not going to – I'm going to say this right here. This is probably the most fun I've had in, like, an interview, like, thus far. I'm, I'm enjoying this so much. Now I've got to go back to now more of a – not a downer, but definitely a reflective question, which is for dealing for – as you guys – I imagine may agree on being an author is it's not easy crafting a story you know mm-hmm. stuff happens life happens situations come about and when you do craft a story nine times out of ten it's going to be different from what you initially conceived and <laughs> then after edits revisions 
covers being changed and then presenting it out on the digital stage, wondering, is this going to hit the audience? Is this going to get the readership that we're looking for? Nine times out of 10, yes. Sometimes nine out of 10, no. And then that voice of imposter syndrome is in the back of everyone's mind saying, what are you doing? You shouldn't be doing this. Like you're, you're doing werewolf stuff. I mean, everyone's doing werewolf stuff. How is yours going to be any different? So for you guys, have you ever had those thoughts of imposter syndrome? And if not, what has continued to discipline you both to work together to tell the story? Because as you guys have already said, you're getting ready for book four. So whatever it's happening, I mean, people love the series so much that you guys are writing more and continuing to flesh out the world. Do you want to go first? Because mine is, you know, I know, you know how that my response to a question like this will be. <laughs> so I thankfully have Ainsley because I would fall into the trap of never getting draft one done. Perfection is the enemy of me every day. Constantly. Mm. Um, but thankfully I have accountability where she pushes me to finish things and then also, it helps just to have somebody to bounce things off of and keep you moving. Get out of my brain. <laughs> That's our thing. We will be working on something and a question will come up and we'll both go, hmm. And then one of us will speak and the other like, get out of my head. Because we all had the exact same idea. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> As far as things like imposter syndromes go, I don't have it. Um, I thought I did. I My day job is coach. I work in code building in various languages for various companies. And I got a mentor who I was explaining to her my imposter syndrome. And she goes, that's not imposter syndrome. I'm like, it's not. She's like, no, that's not imposter syndrome. This is what imposter syndrome usually is. And I was like, oh, I don't feel that way. I am what you have. And if you don't like it, that that's tough for you, I guess. But it doesn't really change how this is what I'm doing. And this is what I bring to the table. And I don't, I'm not asking for a seat at the table. I'm already here. She's like, yeah, mm. that's imposter syndrome. And I was like, oh, I've learned something new today. Um, and I just, I'm writing this because it's fun. I'm writing this because it's a story I want to tell. It's wonderful. That there are people who also would like to read it. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have lead, I'd never get it down on paper. <laughs> but I do. So I'm just taking advantage of that for as long as humanly possible. Yep. And uh, yeah, maybe someday we'll stop writing, but just because someone doesn't like something doesn't change the fact that, hey, we actually wrote the book. That's, that is completely true. And now it's actually now leads into the business side of mm -hmm. being um, authors, which I'm actually curious to hear your guys' uh, answer for the first question. So when you guys were crafting the werewolf uh, elements into the, your, your story, as well as crafting this urban fantasy world where humans and the mythological and the supernatural coexist, it's in the modern times. Mm -hmm. Did you initially, seeing it down on paper and knowing this is where the story is going, did you guys know this would work for the indie publishing because there's a little bit more creative freedom as well as the ability to attract new audiences or did you want to try your hand at traditional publishing and submit it to a house that is known for its dark urban fantasy uh series of books so you you talked to lou the initial so it's probably best you tell the story we wrote the book because we were going to write a book. So yeah, we did. And we finished it. And then we went, okay, now what? And I hit up my friend, Lou Agresta, because I know he had written books and he's been very successful in the land of RPGs. And I knew him through Iron GM. So I was like, hey, Lou, I wrote a book. And he's like, okay, that came out of left field, but continue. <laughs> like, What's going on? And he was like, okay, well, I'm going to give you like the two hour speech then. And I was like, yeah, I'm down. Bring it on. So he explained to us how traditional works, how indie works, how all of this works. And we went, okay got it um if we wanted to go traditional we wrote the wrong book we are not what everyone was looking for we especially weren't on trend in 2022 2022 it was 2021 we talked to lou though oh yeah, so it was right. 2021 we talked to lou and we definitely weren't on trend for what the mm. women were looking for in the land of urban fantasy written by women they, they were looking for okay they were looking for unusual myth mythological creatures which we have, but they're not our protagonists. No. Right. 
So we were the wrong book and we could have gone and fought that battle. Like we can take a no, all right, move on to the next one. It's fine. Like rejection is rejection. It's part of life. But we also are control. <laughs> oh, okay. When explained to us how the land of tradition or traditional work, I was like, ooh, that's going to be rough. And we talked about it and decided we know enough artists that we could get a cover. We can figure out how to do a layout, which we did. We can learn all the pieces that were missing easier than giving up control mm. to the land of traditional publishing. I think, yeah, one of the clinchers that Lou said is in traditional um if you're not the book being pushed, your cover will be less. And we're like, but we really like our cover. Yeah, they this. are really good. They are really, really striking. And honestly, uh, the way I, I see it, I was like, are there four people? Because I see two people and two werewolves. But would it be under the assumption that's actually both of them, but once they're showing their werewolf forms? Yes. So this would be Laika and then her giant hybrided wolf form behind it and Evie with her giant hybrided wolf form around it. It's a stylistic choice that you see both, and it's the same over here. The girls in the Ooh. back on the attack. Nice. Very, very nice. And it's actually now leads perfectly into the audience. And I think you guys may have touched on uh, this a little bit, but I think it's important to dive in deep. So for a series like this, obviously it is in the urban fantasy world, but it definitely has, you know popular monsters and stuff like that. But I'm always interested in how people take their own approach to iconic creatures, like in case, you know, werewolves, vampires, you know, we know what those are. We've seen numerous depictions of them, but I'm always fascinated how authors, you know, throw their own twists onto these iconic creatures. So as a little tangent, so when you guys were crafting the world, especially the werewolves, did you follow the traditional tropes as well as rules that we've seen werewolves depicted in media and other forms of literature? Or did you want to add a little sprinkle of your guys' own idea of like, this is how the werewolves act in our world? So we, a little yes and no. Mm. We looked at all of our characters first and foremost as like, Evie is a person. She right. still has to pay her bills regardless of the fact she's a werewolf. So we built her as a person and we also then built power sets around that. So our werewolves, you're going to see lots of the traditional. All the werewolves are a little stronger than average person. They're a little faster. They're a little hardier. They heal a little quicker. And then every werewolf also has a power that's like their super power. So everyone's mm. super Then there's the werewolves who are super strength werewolves. And we call oh, them. Oh, okay. And so the ones that are physically enhanced, the ones are super speed. They're all northern wolves. One of our, like over here, super hearing. She can hear anything farther than other werewolves. That's her superpower. Evie has empathy, like supernatural empathy, because animals read body language and the flow of things of that nature. So for werewolves, hers is turned up to 11 and she has supernatural empathy. That's her main power. She reads emotions and feelings off of people, but she's still a werewolf. Um, wow. So that's we, actually really cool. We broke them up into three different power sets uh, for werewolves. So there's north, west, and south powers. Sensing tend to be like southern powers. Physical things tend to be um, northern powers. And then west has a little catch-all for things like fast regenerator. No, fast regenerator on south. Fast regens in uh, West. Yeah, it's in West. So yeah, that's so, like they get cut and then Wolverine heal. Exactly. Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, we're very supernatural. Um, no, they don't just turn on the full moon. That's a myth that comes from before when everyone's hiding in the shadows and the full moon has the most light to run by. So they would run at a full moon to do their, their time as a wolf because you need to transform every now and then, but they can turn whenever they want. They have to once a month, roughly. Roughly. But it's not tied to the moon. And then we go out from there. We have seven different types of vampires. And they all drink blood. But they're all different types of vampires with different powers and different weaknesses. All informed by different legends. Like we have our peony vampires, which look very Nosferatu, but pull from Chinese vampires in terms mm -hmm. of their weaknesses. And mm. 
nine different known bloodlines of elves that have nine different powers based on those bloodlines. Our witches, we just do the five elements. So um, we use air, wind, no, sorry, air, fire, earth, water, and metal. And those all inform a different type of magic. So metal is actually a bunch of warding and such. It's black magic, it's resistance and things of that nature. And for our dwarves, we went unlimited there. Whatever their passion is, whatever their craft is, that's what they manipulate and that's what they do. Wow. So I would imagine crafting a world like this is really important for you. I imagine for you guys being like, okay, we have all these elements. We have all these, you know, subsets in our world. Like, as you said, different types of werewolves, different types of vampires, elves, dwarves, witches, etc. And so that can all be, I would imagine, for like the average, like, you know, a lot of jargon may get easily confused. So you want to create where you're going to know all this, but it's not going to confuse the reader. Because I ultimately think, you know, finding that audience is hugely important. And I think a thing that gets often overlooked, because as I'm sure you guys will agree, you guys created the story for you guys initially. But when wanting to share this with everyone else, I imagine you guys really had to fine tune. It's like, okay, who exactly are we marketing to? Are we marketing to people who love the supernatural or are we marketing to people who love the urban fantasy uh, setting? So for you guys, this is a two-parter. How important is it, in your guys' opinion, for an author to really know who their audience is? And do you guys now know have a good idea of who your audience is with the first, second, third, and now the fourth book? I feel like it is very important to have at least some idea as you're going into crafting a story, who are you going to be speaking to? Because a book that is you're writing and expecting like 16 to 18 year olds to read would have very different theming than mm -hmm. even like 22 to 24. Most college years are very different from high school. Right. Yes. So it's very important to know your audience to some degree of where you're going um, and know the limitations of your audience. If you're writing a YA book, you can't drop that many swear words. Why? Because their parents won't like it, period. And you got to right. know that. We didn't want that restriction, so we don't write anything for YA. We are technically classified new adult. I think we're in the new adult category, yeah. Again, that's the same term I've heard. Again, you're the second a group of people that have mentioned new duel. And I was like, that is now becoming a popular thing now. I literally had a guest an hour ago who said, yeah, my book is new adult. I was like, what the heck is new adult? And then she broke it down to me. It's like, okay, so it's literally the transition from young adult to adult. Okay, that makes uh, sense. But I was like, I had no idea what that mean. I had no idea what she was referring to. So YA got so big because the stories that are in it are super compelling and a lot of fun. But things that were marked as YA, I would read some of them and go, I would not give that to my 13 year old sister. Absolutely not. That that was meant for someone 20 up. So mm. the, it, it's a good thing that the new category is kind of coming out and it's being a thing. It also gives us a spot to go because like, don't get me wrong, Hunger Games was fine, but I'm, I'm an adult and sometimes I want to read about adults, but not necessarily feisty adults. <laughs> right. Definitely. Now going to the next uh, question, which I'm actually intrigued to hear this answer from you both. So as authors, we're always inspired by, you know, the works we've read uh, growing up, as well as other forms of media, movies, television, games, whatever. And they all impact our own writing. But we don't necessarily want to steal those things and implement our own writing. We just want to be inspired. And one um, author said this, which I think is very important, is that for any first-time author, I'm always inspired by all the stuff I've read, but I never want to say, oh, this person writes exactly like George R. R. Martin. I don't want that. I want to be my own author. I want them to be like, oh, this is a book by um, Eric Bowden. They know what to expect when they read a book by Eric mm -hmm. Bowden. They want to have that originality and uniqueness to them. So for you guys, um, Ainsley and Lita, who are some of the authors that really helped you guys sort of come to your own in terms of like crafting the story, in terms of like characters, world building, 
power ups, uh, you know, the magic structure, and even movies and television, and even games too. Well, we have touched on two of them already with uh, Love, Death, and Robots, and then Werewolf the Apocalypse, uh, White Wolf's Werewolf. I don't know which version we're on right now. I, I don't either. I didn't like the new lore that came out of Werewolf. <laughs> Both yeah. of those obviously impacted us, but then there's tons of books, okay. and we have very different lists. <laughs> we're nerds. Let's let's get that out. <laughs> you hadn't figured it out yet. We are we are nerds. We're not pretending mm -hmm. to be but <laughs> so. Uh, when I was in college, you know all those those uh, people who are on like Bookstagram and Book Talk, and they tell you they yes. read like 100 books a year. I was one of them. I consumed an insane amount of media, which is how I discovered urban fantasy when I was in college. Like 200 books a year, easy. I'm not doing anything but reading books. Um, and from those, the things that come up is I'm a huge Jim Butcher fan. Uh, mm. the files were my first urban fantasy series it's why i love this series and like i go from there so i've been reading dresden for a very long time i want to say there were only like two or three books out when i picked it up to begin with um and so i've kept up on that but also like kelly armstrong she had these books about adult women in supernatural doing cool things and it wasn't all about romance all the time there was mysteries in there um charlene harris kim harrison things like that uh they're big influences for me. They wrote, and as far as I'm concerned, a lot of those people set this genre that I then get to come in and play with. So that's that's mm. a lot of where I'm from. I've always been into the urban fantasy, but I missed things like uh, Game of Thrones and Lord <laughs> of the Rings. Like everyone's like, you must be a huge Lord of the Rings fan. I'm like, mm, I've never read the books. <laughs> and on the flip side, <laughs> yeah. I would be the fantasy reader. Oh yeah, so, Lord of the Rings, um, Chronicles of Amber. Game of Thrones, all of that. That's kind of what I did. And then when I met Ainsley, like prior, like I did have some interest in werewolves. Like, uh, what was the novel? Blood and Chocolate. I can't remember the author. Mm -hmm. It was a little, little thing that I read in like middle school, but yeah. it's always been there. And then she gave me Women of the Other World and off it went from there because I had already loved things like Underworld, that series mm -hmm. of movies, even though they got oh, ridiculous. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Van Helsing. That is some oh, of the. Informations on scene. When we got our cover artist Tina, and we were trying to explain, okay, we want werewolves, but we need to be really careful that we don't want, like, we want monsters. We want monstrous werewolves here. And she was like, okay. And we're like, like Van Helsing. And she was like, oh, I totally know what you mean now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I mean, that is true. And I also think it's also a guy you touched on that because going back to the beginning, as I said, you know. We have these ideas, you know, these iconic monsters, but they've taken on a different shape. And they have their own categories, even in film. You have the full transformation werewolves, where it's like um, an American werewolf in London, where it's like a full anthropomorphic mm -hmm. giant wolf. You have the Van Helsing uh, werewolf, where he has a human build. He's very muscular, but has a wolf head. You have the underworld, where they're more dog-like as opposed to like you know the lichens and then the true blood werewolves then the hybrids and then mm -hmm. another term i've heard in the werewolf lore pug faces that refers to the wolfman uh with lon Chaney jr as well as benicio del toro in that remake so that is really 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 fascinating and now going to the next question which you guys touched about which in terms of readership which I think is very important to discuss because it's different from the audience. You can cater to an audience, but who exactly are reading your books? Because where does this book uh, fit in? Uh, again, going back to another guest I had earlier this month, he wanted his book to be the bridge between people who love Percy Jackson, and now they've grown up and they're reading uh, George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones. He wanted that to be the bridge that fans of both can enjoy. And that also highlighting another author whose name escapes me at the moment, but she was a big fan of the dystopian worlds of the young adult series. And then as she grew older, she realized that there really wasn't a lot in like the dystopian for adults. So she created a book that was a bridge to that, which is really, really fascinating. So, and again, you guys have touched on this before, but how important is it for 
an author to really understand who exactly their readers are. Because you can market to everybody, but you got to figure out, okay, am I marketing to the young adults? Am I marketing to the new adults? My book has romance, but it's not specifically a romance fantasy. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? It's very important to know. I mean, market to everyone is a strategy. It's a, it's a very viable strategy because sometimes um, they don't know they're here for what you're selling until they know about it, right? So that's it's right. a viable strategy. Um, but we're, we're more towards, uh, I'm trying to find a way to say this. That's no shade on anybody. Cause I have zero shade for what everyone enjoys reading. We need more out of romance books, but we also need more out of action books because lots of the time mm -hmm. it's fantasy actions and it's this one dude being perfect, doing everything perfectly in his little harem situation. But that's not a romance. That's not a real romance, at least. And we're looking for something that's got the depth of character that you can get in a romance with the depth of story you can get in an urban fantasy. And we want to be that spot in there, right? Our right. characters would find in a romance, but we have stories that you would find in an urban fantasy series instead. Nice. I think that sums okay. it up pretty well. But to be clear, I'm not throwing shade on anyone who likes those things because everyone likes things and they deserve to enjoy the things they like. Right. Just because my favorite book isn't your favorite book doesn't mean your favorite book is wrong. No. And and that's the thing I found out uh, too. Well, uh, before one author who was a romance fantasy author, I was explaining to her that the romance genre is like the most read in the publishing world. And she was like, how like I do a double take? It's like, you're serious? It's like, yeah, it's read more than any other genre of book in like a month. I think it's read six times in one month as opposed to one series, which is like read in six months. It's crazy. And that leads to another discussion, which will tie into this, which is trying to join the gravy train or what's happening in the publishing world because romance fantasy is like the dominant one. That's where everyone's trying to market to or write books where it's romance fantasy, even though it may not be, because it has these other elements that they're really more suited for other genres, but because romance fantasy is the dominant one at the moment, mm -hmm. it has to be that. Which comes down to a thing I like to discuss, which are the two paths. To be an author and to be known as an author. And I always find this discussion very interesting with talking with my uh, guests, because I just added it uh, very recently. For me... I think every author wants to be known as an author. They want to be New York Times bestseller. They want to get literacy acclaim. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's the long-term goals if you're a first-time author and you're just starting out and you're green. And one person uh, said that every author should just be an author. Focus on writing, build themselves up, Capital is not the main driving force. Yes, money is nice and it's important, but it shouldn't be the driving force because if you are solely geared towards the money, trying to add tropes, trying to follow the gravy train, your passion for writing is going to die. You're not going to enjoy it anymore. And ultimately, an old guest of mine said this powerful thing, which I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this, is that there is no guarantee that a first-time author's debut novel is going to be the start of their legacy. Th there is no guarantee. Now, on the other side, some authors, first-time books, have reached literacy claim. Good for them. That was a lot of work to do. But nine times out of ten, that's not the case. And imposter syndrome comes back even more with a vengeance. So for you guys, in your opinion, how important is it for first-time authors to really understand that their debut novel does not guarantee it's going to be the start of their legacy, but it should not deter them from writing and creating stories? I can take a yeah, part, part of this. Um, so we both have day jobs that are not writing. We don't, we don't look to our projects like our books to make money. We'd like them to be self-sufficient, but... They are definitely not some days. Not some days. Um, <clears throat> and growing up, 
I always liked lots of creative things. I loved visual arts. I loved writing. I loved this. And I made the decision in my late teens that I didn't want to make those a career path because the moment that your livelihood, your rent, your food is tied to your muse, your muse is going to up and leave you. Mm, okay. But at the same time, if I'm doing this, we're going to make the best thing that we can. We aim to, how do you, how do you usually phrase it? Like we try to make oh. our books indistinguishable from traditional publish. We're an indie ah. publisher, but when you pick up our book, you shouldn't be able to tell the difference. Ah, and you actually brought up a really important thing, which the indie publishing uh, world has greatly changed because I definitely think in the beginning, 20 years ago, when people heard indie publishing, there was a stigmatism to it that's like not professional. It's cheap. There's no yeah. uh, professional uh, level to it. You can easily distinguish between the two. Now, 20 years later, you can't tell. I can't tell the difference between traditional publishing and indie publishing because it's gotten that good. And it is really, really incredible. I mean, you can if you okay. want to. I'm going to go grab the hard covers and then you're going to tell me if you can tell the difference. Okay. <laughs> So we almost talked, we actually switched our print shop recently. We were using Amazon Print on Demand, which does kind of that's where a lot of the the a lot of the accusations of them feeling cheap kind of came from because Amazon Print on Demand mm. is cheap. Especially if you get author copies, they get slapped onto the end of other runs. So you get stuff that's misaligned all the time. Um uh. The new names in the print on demand space, thankfully. So, of course, Ingram and Amazon have been the big dogs for a while. There's Lulu, um, but uh, we're using one now called Book Vault, which is out of the EU, and their quality is amazing. They just got their. You tell me these don't look legit. I can't see them. <laughs> <laughs> these are our new hard covers. Oh, those are nice. Right. The internals of our new hard covers. And we got where they at. Unlike Amazon, we can do this. Unlike Amazon, we can do this without parking over a foot and all that. We can do color. Oh, that is amazing. That is really good. They have it on do not try this at home. I have it on fairly decent authority. <laughs> so when you take all of these hard covers, they can stop a small caliber round. <laughs> oh well, well, this so you is say like book big one. Camp, Don't do like, but I have oh. it. Good oh my gosh, that that was a that that was a little that was awesome. Oh, but man, but those books are really really incredible, and they really are, you know, the eye catcher. Like they really draw the reader, um, in. Oh, that is nice. And it's actually another thing we haven't talked about, which I don't think I talked about recently, which is the cover, because that's truly the selling point of the book. The cover really has to resonate with the story, which I think a lot of people, I've seen a lot of books that have like, you know, illustrations, images like, well, okay, I can get an idea of what the book is. But then when you read the book, it does not match the cover. It's like a movie poster with a movie. They don't match. So for you guys, when you crafted this cover, how important was it for you guys that what the cover represented had to correlate with the story? So the cover needs to do two jobs for you. It needs to invoke a question mm -hmm. that will make somebody pick it up and turn it around. Okay? That's, that's the job of the cover, to pick it up and turn it around. It is judged by this. And hold on. Nope, you had your second point. So it, it's, its job is to do that, but it's also to invoke the feeling of the book. I don't mm -hmm. actually need to be 100% accurate to everything that's going on. They shouldn't lie to you, right? Right. A vampire attacking people and then have no vampires in the book. Like, that's a lie. But yes. Dresden's hat doesn't matter. Yeah, Dresden's hat doesn't matter, okay? He never <laughs> does. He's never had a hat. And it, it doesn't matter. 
it's fine. Like it's it's a running joke at this point that Dresden always has a hat on the cover, but he's never right. So did the hat did the hat really matter in the long run? And no, we got books in before we realized he didn't have a hat. So no, I don't believe covers need to be a hundred percent accurate, but they should be invoking the feeling of the book. They should be telling you something and they should be creating a question that makes you go, uh, what does the back of that book say? Mm, okay, nice. And then also another thing for any authors especially is the community. The any other community has been like so it's been booming on Bookstagram, Book Talk. It's incredible. And I know people want to say, oh, you're in com competition with these fellow um, authors. Not necessarily because we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to tell our stories. It's a little bit different, um, as one person said, like in traditional publishing where you want to market your story because to that to them, it's a business. You have to sell a product that's going to make them money. And if it doesn't, unfortunately, your book's going to get axed because it didn't make any money. The beautiful thing about independent publishing or indie publishing is that you can go back to your story and re-edit it and market it as a second edition. And no one's going to be the wiser. No one's going to know unless you tell them this mm -hmm. is the second edition. So ultimately, for you guys, uh, what or say who have been the biggest supporters of you on this journey? And would you like to give any name drops to authors you guys have met on this journey? I mean, Lou. Lou is definitely like number one. What is his new title? Accidental Mentor? He's our accidental mentor. So <laughs> Lou. For sure. Um, oh. So we're part of a writing group called Superstars Writing. So there's actually quite a few mm. authors who've kind of mm -hmm. helped us along. And their motto is like a rising tide lifts all ships. And it's true. Mm -hmm. So like we could name drop people, but while they've stopped and they've helped us and they've given us advice and they've set us on the right path, they're probably doing it for a lot of people. So they don't remember exactly <laughs> helping us. Like they, they right. Um, like we had a whole evening. We talked to Fred Hughes, and Fred Hughes gave us a lot of good information about covers and marketing and all of that, and it was really helpful. But he's probably giving that speech to like a bunch of people there, so mm -hmm. he wouldn't remember us from them per se. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we were in. Superstars writing, and there's a lot of help that mm. you can do, as uh, Lita said. And we agree because let's say that our book does amazing. We we rise the tide for everyone. Well, then right. there's lots of room for people to come in behind and start writing their own um, scary monster urban fantasy open world series about female werewolves because, well, I would like to read that. I mean, obviously, I enjoy it. So it'd be really nice if somebody else was yeah. also and then I could enjoy their stories too. And if someone lifts the tide and everyone goes, oh, well, that's real, that's professional, then it gives us an opportunity for them to consider, well, these ones might be too. Yeah, we're not in competition with the people in the indie. We're just, we do everything we can to help. We're yeah. mentoring three authors right now, technically, yep. who are behind us in the process. We're not far, but they're behind us. So we're just like, yeah, here's how you do all of the things. Nice. Need somebody at con we're like oh you need to learn how to do layout send us an email send us an email i'll tell you exactly how we do our layouts because we do um everything on our own because we do <laughs> we're like yeah yeah there's publishing a book and we did her layout for her in exchange for some editing and uh <laughs> other things like that we're like why wouldn't we like her dreams to put a book out there then hells yeah we'll do it there who cares like it, we're not in competition Wow. You know, and it is, it is true because we're always trying to grow and build. And I like the thing you said, I would say like a uh, tide brings up all uh, ships. A rising tide raises all ships. A rising tide raises all ships. I like that. I, I like that a lot. And it is, it is true. We're all trying to grow. And also to add to that, mm -hmm. grit trumps talent. Doesn't matter if you are the best a uh, prose writer you can make characters jump on screen you can make something in the book describing food that's so delicious i want to eat my own book doesn't matter <laughs> if you're not willing to go through the hurdles that we're all going through the stress you know life will always come in and derail things or set things back that that is 
always going to happen. That's sometimes out of our control. But we persevere. We go through it. And if you're not willing to accept that or saying you want to reap the rewards but not go through any of the hurdles, the fires and the flames, little Dragon Force reference, everybody, then you may want to reevaluate uh, your goals that you set out initially. And if you do, then grit transforms into talent. And going back to what we said about the first book being the start of your legacy, it may take you 10, 20 books. And the 20th book is probably people will most know you for. And when that happens, you can tell them, hey, if you've enjoyed my 20th book, see 19 all the way down to number one to see <laughs> my growth as an author. And boom, you've got new readers for mm -hmm. different audiences, different age groups whatsoever. Because at the end of the day, Every author wants to achieve a sense of immortality because ultimately our works are going to outlive us all. They're going to be the last uh, testaments of who we are. And that is our contributions to the publishing world to leave behind a legacy. And <clears throat> sorry, ultimately with everything said and learning from everyone else in the industry, what is your guys's word of wisdom to fellow authors out there wanting to get their uh, foot in the door. Would you like to go first? Do you want me to? You can go ahead. I know you know. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to writing, you have to you have to write it. You can fix mm. a bad page. You cannot fix a blank page. Yes. That is it, it simple yeah. and to the point, and it's true. And one thing I always like to add to that, something that I've told a lot of my friends, write drunk, edit sober. <laughs> Doesn't that okay, no, I can see that. No, I've done that. <laughs> walk asleep. Yeah, definitely. Um, the other one that people who are just starting their writing journey, and something you said earlier made me think of this, avoid vanity publishers. Yes. If you are so desperate to publish your book, don't do it. Send us an email. We don't really care who you are. We'll tell you how to get it over the line and have one of these in your hand for a couple hundred dollars, not, not a couple thousand where you have a box of 300 books sitting in your closet for more. We don't know how to sell and they're crappy Amazon grade anyway because all of them are just using KDP and charging. Yes to check a checkbox oh yeah when we found that one out <laughs> oh my yes i'm actually glad you brought that up uh too because not just vanity publishing uh vanity editing services mm. that's another one. Oh, that's a good one um always know what kind of editor you're looking for oh yeah mm -hmm. we're much like doctors you want the one that's there to do the job you need done not you don't get a foot surgeon to do heart surgery for you you don't know nope. develop editor to do your line edits yep yes that that is very very true all of these are greatly important and kind of like a little bonus question for you guys this is like a true reflective question how different would your guys lives be if you guys didn't make this book we probably have more sleep less sleep debt <laughs> we probably have less sleep debt but I think we'd be poorer for it. Yeah. Mm. It's there's like three concrete thing. Well, three, five. Th that, if you count the novellas, it's sort of like concrete proof that we finished a thing. Today, oh, yes, those do get here in the yeah, mail. Okay, those arrive in the mail today. We we <laughs> something that allowed us to get like cheap ads to Book Vault, and therefore we then went. Well, we can just take all our novellas and make them paperback now, and it makes us happy. So who cares? Um, but yes. Yeah, the, our lives would be poorer for it. It's a story that enriched us. This is something that allows us to be extremely creative, collaborate. Mm -hmm. Which we do love. Mm -hmm. Collaborate mm -hmm. without other people, <laughs> which we also love. So, yeah, <clears throat> I just think of the lives would be a little poorer for it. We probably would have filled it with something else. We don't know what rest is. <laughs> yeah, no, we take, our, we take our time off from work to do book work or cons or stuff or oh, anything that we want to do so we're always doing something we would have filled it with something but i'm very glad we filled it with this nice nice and ultimately i think it's just a perfect point to like 
and this incredible double author interview here on the channel. Thank you very much, viewers and listeners, for joining us for our third double author feature here on the channel. Again, a huge thank you to authors Ainsley and Lita for coming on the show and telling all of us about Moonburn and more about their urban fantasy theories. Now, before we officially end, um, where can people find and engage with you guys on social media and where can they purchase uh, the beginning books in this series? So our most active areas in social media are our Instagram. You can find us at Wolf and Rose Books. Uh, we'll give you the link to that, obviously. And then from there, if you want to chat with us, we are Discord junkies. We live in the land of Discord. We're online all day. We have a server. Come and hang out with us. We'll talk about just about anything and chill in our little server together. Plus all the sneak peeks. People in that server saw these covers way before everybody else. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I can't not spoil things, <laughs> but she needs to not do it on Instagram. Um, mm -hmm. So you can it over there and then shop.wolfandrose.net gives you direct to us so you can buy from us direct and we can guarantee the quality of things that come from us direct and uh from there we're wide so you can find us in barnes and noble you can find us on kindle you can find Google us books amazon Kobo, tolino now tolino, in germany tolino we got on there <laughs> we're, we're wide you can find us just about anywhere that they will let us put our book up and sell it awesome i will link all that down below in the description <laughs> of this video Thank you all viewers and listeners for joining us for another author interview here on the channel. Again, a huge thank you to Ainsley and Lena for coming on the show. And this won't be the last time. No, who knows? I may give them, get them back on the show again for a returning uh, double author interview to tell us about maybe another work they are making or maybe a little teaser of book four. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But if you want to be up to date with Moonburn and the other books in the series, make sure to follow them on their Instagram provided in the link down below. Thank you all so very much. Make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below. What was your favorite part of the interview? And as always, this is The Wandering Scribe signing out, wishing you all a wonderful day.